Okay, guys, good morning. Welcome back again. Um, just a few minutes, about two minutes, really, and then we will be good to go for today. Hope you guys had a nice couple of days since Wednesday, getting some good sleep, and <clears throat> let's just take this lecture in, and then we'll be on to the weekend. Good morning, Alex. Hi, Julia. Good to see everybody. How's it going? Hi, Grant. Hey, Ryan. Sloan, Eloise. Hey there. Hi, Ryan. One second, I'm just going to get a little um, glass of water. Hi, guys. One, one second. Hey, everyone. Okay, hey there. It's pretty much 9 a.m., so thanks again, everyone. Good to see you guys. Uh, let's just get started. So welcome back. Basically, it's today, uh, Friday, March 5th. And the plan is that we're going to try and finish off the remaining parts of uh, Peter Singer's article. So that's kind of a two-part lecture. It's a very detailed article with a lot of information there. So I gave us uh, two full periods to just kind of go through it. And welcome back, Noah, and everyone else here. As usual, um, nice to be with you guys. So let me just kind of set the stage here. We're going back over um, and we're going back into the writing of Peter Singer. And his article from 1993, Rich and Poor. <clears throat> okay, so we're still um, working through the topic of ethics in this class and moving beyond just ethical theory of utilitarianism and Kantianism. We're now trying to do what they call applied ethics, which is when you try and apply these ethical theories to the consideration of actual um, debated questions and controversies in life and in the world. And um, the debate that we're kind of taking a look at is this question, do we have any moral obligation to assist the third world global poor? Um, Peter Singer's overall position is that we do have a moral obligation. And so he's trying to, you know, construct an argument towards that conclusion throughout his paper. Um, on Monday, when we come back after this weekend, we'll see the other side of this whole debate by looking at the writing of uh, Garrett Hardin, who certainly doesn't agree and thinks that we don't have the obligation to assist the poor. But we're going to look first at Singer. And let me just kind of remind you of a few basic things that he said. Um, he begins the paper by defining absolute poverty, which is not having sufficient income or wealth to even meet the very basic human needs of food, clothing, and shelter. And he kind of just tries to emphasize to the reader um, how bad that condition of life is how it kills a lot of people through starvation, hunger, disease, even a lot of children die in this way each year in the third world. He mentions that we in the first world don't necessarily get to see the full depths of human poverty in our own lives and in our own communities, but it's out there in the world. Um, he refers to the fact that there's over a billion people in the world living in absolute poverty. And so since it is a huge um, detriment to human happiness and um, well-being, he thinks of it as a, a major thing to try and address if you're a utilitarian, because utilitarians want us to do whatever promotes the most overall human happiness. And the status quo, according to which there's a lot of people dying and starving in absolute poverty, 
is uh, counteractive to overall human happiness. So he says some might have argued that this problem is inevitable and um, impossible to solve because there's simply not enough consumable resources. Some argue, therefore, that it's a problem of scarcity when you have an overabundance of people and a deficit of food and consumable resources. How can you possibly feed everybody? But he doesn't agree with that claim because he says the real problem isn't so much having to do with scarcity of the resources that we could produce, but rather poor distribution and waste of the available resources. In one case, he mentions that um, due to our reliance on animal agriculture and meat, <clears throat> we waste a lot of consumable resources, diverting it basically to the farm animals that we later on eat instead of straight to people. Uh, and that would result in a lot of additional savings and efficiency with regard to consumable resources if more people if were vegetarian or just ate less meat. And then um, he also talks about the degree of waste that happens in the Western world when it comes to like food. So he says, therefore, we might be deficient in a moral obligation to assist the global poor. We live in absolute affluence, which is the opposite of absolute poverty. Absolute affluence, simply having more than enough income and wealth to meet the same basic needs of food, clothing, and shelter. He reminds us again that in the parts of the world where absolute poverty prevails, the average per capita income of a person living in this kind of condition is, at the time of his writing, 200 US dollars per year. I mean, today it might be more close to like 400, but still it's a paltry sum if you're going to try and use that to stretch throughout a whole year of survival. So um, he notes that the United Nations target goal of 0.7% of gross domestic product, we've fallen far short even of that. And so he asks this question, and that's kind of where we started to wrap up last time. Is there any way of comparing the moral characteristic of a killer with those that fail to assist? Um, one might argue that when failing to assist, you deny um, resources to people that otherwise would have survived with the provision of the resources. Is this different from killing, which is an intended act, which leads to the loss of life? Um, well, there probably is a difference between killing and failing to assist, and he's certainly aware of that. And so he wants to try and at least at mention what the differences could be before going back and trying to show that there still is something wrong with the failure to assist. And so when we left class, um, we had discussed all these different differences between killing and failing to assist. So if you can remember, this is all just review, getting us back up to speed. But one of them was it's a different motive. A killer obviously has a sadistic and evil motive, which is to, to harm and to end life. But the motive that one of us has in failing to assist and instead just spending it on ourselves is not at all a desire for anyone's death or harm. Instead, it's just the pursuit of your own happiness and self-interest. That's a different motive. Another difference is the difference in terms of how difficult it is to live up to these two given obligations. The obligation to not kill is easy to live up to. You don't have to do anything. But the obligation to save lives through assistance is not as easy because you actually have to do things, give money, give time, give effort, energy, attention to the issue. So not killing, not a problem, that's very easy, but it's not so easy to save lives through aid. Another difference is that uh, there's a different level of certainty of the outcome. In going out and setting forth to kill people on purpose, it's very clearly uh, probable that someone will be hurt or killed, which is sad, but it's true. Um, on the other hand, if you fail to aid or give assistance, there's always some room to doubt whether or not the aid itself would have even helped anyone. So it's not as quite clear that that leads to harm when you fail to assist, as in the case of killing or deciding to kill. There's a difference in terms of identifiability of the victim. A killer, a shooter, for example, does kill specific individuals, and there's no debate that that's their victim, that it's their fault. But in failing to assist, even if, let's say, people die around in the third world from starvation, um, there's no way we can connect the two things, an individual's um, declining to aid and uh, another individual in the third world having died on that occasion or nearby to that time. And then, finally, you can always say it's not my fault that they are poor, but no similar comment could ever be given in a killer's case. You can't say it's not my fault these people were killed, but if you, you know, if you had killed them. So these are differences between killing and failing to assist. Um, let me list them one time again, just on the board, and then I'm going to tell you how Peter Singer replies to them, okay? So this is the author, title, and date, and uh, here was the heading that we were working through, differences <clears throat> between killing and failing to assist. Okay, now... Um, 
that's it, right? We didn't talk about his responses yet to these differences. If I remember correctly, we just kind of got to the point where we said what the differences were. Um, so the different motivation. Certainty of the outcome. Identifiability of victim. Um, not hard to not kill, but very hard to save lives. <clears throat> save all lives you could, okay? And then finally, you can always say, it's not my fault or poor. And that's a difference because you can never claim a lack of responsibility in the act of killing. <clears throat> okay, so keep in mind the bigger picture here is that Peter Singer does believe we have this obligation to assist. So he has presented these differences just in an effort to inform the reader of what an opponent of his argument might say when he raises the point that killing and failing to assist are somewhat comparable. But after having mentioned these differences, he returns to the uh, argument and he says, none of these points though really show that it's totally okay to not help people that are poor. They don't remove all blame from the failure to assist. All they do is perhaps show that killing for, for whatever, you know, is worse than failing to assist. But that doesn't mean that failing to assist is totally okay and there's nothing wrong with it. So let me tell you how he, uh, replies to these these notes. Lack of identifiable victim, identifiability of the victim. So here's how he says that's not necessarily going to absolve blame from the one that fails to assist. Um, so he gives a hypothetical scenario, okay? I'll give you his hypothetical scenario and then I'll modify it a little bit because I think I can think of another more relatable version of the same point, but here's his case. He says, imagine there was a salesperson who sells a consumable product and they sell it, obviously, because it's something they can profit from. But the problem is that in this um, product that is consumable, there's a chemical within it. And when it's ingested, it will double a person's risk of later contracting stomach cancer. So that's the problem with his, um, the thing that he sells, that it's got a chemical in it that doubles the risk of cancer. But he sells it anyway, knowing that he can make profit off of it. And that's how it goes. So look, one day, sometime later, the guy who purchased this product and consumed it does get stomach cancer. So let's suppose that he returns to the vendor with this complaint. You have, um, I'm blaming you, it's your fault. I have stomach cancer and it's because I consumed your product. I looked up, I looked into it and it shows that, you know, you have sold this product which has a chemical that doubles the risk of stomach cancer. Now I've got stomach cancer, it's your fault. Um, now imagine that the salesperson tries to excuse themselves from moral blame by saying this back. How can you say that it's my fault? Um, you, know, you don't know for sure that this stomach cancer that you have came from using my product. Because remember, the product and the chemical just doubles the risk. But it's possible that that's just a false positive indicator and you actually got it from some other source. So although you have stomach cancer and this chemical does double the risk, we can't say for sure it came from that chemical. It might be that you already had it from genetics or that you got it from some environmental exposure to a different um, carcinogenic pathogen or whatever. So <clears throat> how can we say for sure you're my victim? So now I'm going to tell you it's not my fault and I have no blame. That doesn't really remove all the blame though. And here's why. I hope it's kind of obvious because you still added risk. Not to worry, high chase. Um, this vendor of the product, he still exposed all the consumers, the customers, to this additional doubled um, degree of risk for the, for the disease. So even if we cannot pinpoint with total precision who has got the disease specifically from his use of the chemical versus just from some external cause, isn't it wrong by itself that he just added knowingly risk of death to people's lives? Still by comparison now, right? You can say that... Um, in failing to assist, there's no one in the world that we can specifically point out and say, hey, that's the one person who died because you didn't give aid. But when failing to aid, you know that you add to the pool of risk um, that some unknown individuals will inevitably face. And so even if we cannot you know, draw a line between one 
declining to aid and one person starvation. The additional degree of risk that you um, contribute to with the failure to aid is by itself wrong enough on par with the case of this salesperson. I don't know. I mean, that's his example. It's a weird example, though, because it's like uh, it's about a guy selling a product, a chemical, and it's kind of hard to construct a scenario, maybe. Here's something more re realistic. Okay, so we're in the middle of a pandemic, obviously, and the responsible thing for people to do and when they're going out in public is to wear a mask. Suppose that there's a guy or whoever that doesn't want to wear this mask and, you know, they just go around um, getting close quarters to people, no mask, blah, blah, blah. So, like, later on, let's suppose that it's discovered that that person actually had COVID-19 and someone who they were interacting with during the time when they were not masked ended up getting the disease, okay? So this person could come to them and they could say, sort of like the customer to the vendor that I just mentioned in the, the author's example, they could come and say, look, it's, it's your fault. You shouldn't have been so um, casual and loose about the way you wear a mask or don't wear a mask because you did that stuff and later it came to light that you got infected and now I actually have it because I was standing in, in places nearby to you. Now the person could claim, you can't tell for sure that you got it from me. I know we were hanging out during the time when, you know, um, I could have exposed you, but who knows, you know, you might have got lucky and not got it from me and then you just did get it from someone else that you interacted with on the same day. There's no way to prove that you got it from me with total precision and absolute certainty. But at the same time, don't you think that this was wrong in and of itself, even if we can't map like the connection from the choice not to wear the mask to specific people that got sick, just because you add additional risk. So again, the point I hope kind of makes sense. This is way of Peter Singer um, coming back and trying to reply to this point that identifiability of the victim takes all the wrongness away from those that fail to assist. Okay, so let's continue going through his responses. What about different degree of certainty of the outcome? Okay, well for that he gives an interesting example that I think is kind of clear. Take two cases for a moment. One case, the case of a homicidal driver, a driver who's trying to hit people with his car on purpose because he wants to kill as many as he can, like um, using the, wep the car as a, as a weapon. Um, that has happened unfortunately, it's not even just a total hypothetical if you know about it, it's happened in um, France and Germany, terrorist attacks where people try to drive crowd a uh, car into crowds and killed a lot of people even closer to home this has happened in a, me a mentally ill guy did it on the Venice Beach boardwalk and actually killed a couple that was honeymooning from Europe very sad uh, Santa Monica farmers market um, a guy I don't know what happened but it was an older guy he seems to have lost control of his car some people look, thought he looked like he was doing it on purpose but anyway this is something that can and has happened so just consider that possibility of a person trying to hit people with his car on purpose on the other hand I want you to think of a just drunk driver, not homicidal, but drunk, too drunk to drive, not safe behind the wheel. Okay, now, who of those two cases is likelier to hit and kill people when they get behind the wheel? The homicidal driver with full intent to kill or the drunk driver? That's my question. Who do you think would be the likelier case of actually certainly causing a deadly outcome here? Neither one is safe. Neither thing is a good thing to do. But if you had to just choose which one's even deadlier, it's the homicidal driver, correct, Ryan? Because if that person hits people, it won't be inadvertent. It's exactly what he's trying to do. So he's going to you know, deploy all skill and um, all his full uh, capacities uh, and capabilities to try and hit people. So that's highly likely then in that case. Now, in the drunk driver's case, does this mean that he's done nothing wrong because the homicidal driver's behavior is even more deadly and even more certain to cause harm? So does that just take all the blame away from the other guy because he's not trying to hit people? No, it still clearly is wrong. Even though when he hits or if he hits people, it won't be on purpose. It won't be like his deliberate intended result, but it's still something that very well could happen and it becomes more likely because of the negligence that he's taking when he takes the wheel. So. In the same way, you could argue that when you fail to assist, who really knows if it's going to lead to any harm? It's not as certain as if you like went to the third world and tried shooting at four people and they're starving on purpose. But at the same time, um, can we really say that that's totally blameless just because it's even more likely to cause harm when somebody sets out to kill? Um, therefore, on a par with the behavior of our drunk driver, which doesn't intend harm but is still taking action which knowingly could lead to it, um, the additional risk that they add to those unknown individuals is wrong enough by itself for us to cr criticize and condemn it. Okay, and then um, how about this one that you can always say it's not my fault, they're poor, 
but you can't say anything similar when, you, when with the case of killing. Um, he has two points in reply to that, a little um, two-point reply. So he says, first of all, one could maybe just push back at the claim itself and say, how, what do you mean it's not our fault that they're poor? So some argue that if you, you know, trace the history back a little ways, you're going to see a system of colonialism that divested wealth from third world countries to first world Western and European countries. And so if the colonial system of economic exploitation led to the establishment of many of these inequities, you know, the global haves and have nots, then you could say we who continue to benefit from the original uh, ill-gotten gains are somewhat indirectly responsible to restore equality and justice. So, you know, if we have ancestors, some of us who might have been a part of the economic exploitation of colonialism, which led to many people in the third world being poorer and therefore likely to starve, do we not bear some measure of indirect responsibility to right these wrongs, these historical injustices, if you believe they exist? Now, he knows that not everyone would follow and agree with that line of argument because to many people, even if you know there were there were institutions and practices in the past that were unjust, slavery, you know, um, plunder of wealth from indigenous and native cultures, uh, even if those things happened, some people might reasonably argue that um, we cannot face moral responsibility for the misdeeds of prior generations. The whole thing that some say you can't visit the sins of the father on the son. So if a person does not find favor with that line of argument, he has a second way of replying to this, which is that if you're a utilitarian, which Peter Singer thinks is the right moral system, if you're a utilitarian, then your standing moral obligation always is to just do whatever it is that will generate the most overall happiness. It doesn't say just create the most overall happiness when you created the problem that is needing to be solved. It's just whether you um, set the fire or not, if you're in position to put it out um, at, without great cost to yourself, then that's a moral obligation for you as a utilitarian. For example, a utilitarian couldn't walk up to a burning building that could easily be um, opened in a way that would let the occupants out to safety and just say, well, I didn't light this fire, so I'm not at fault for the fact that these people are in trouble. Therefore, I can just keep walking because it's not my obligation to help them. If you're a utilitarian, then declining to aid whenever the aid would produce more overall happiness is an obligation for you, even if you don't feel particularly personally responsible for the fact that people are in need. So two ways of pushing back on this. Number one, at least some could argue that indirectly we bear a moral responsibility for misdeeds of past generations. Or if you don't agree with this, then just be a utilitarian and then whether or not it's our fault, we're on the scene and we have a chance to make things better, so we should just do that. And then, um, <clears throat> okay, just two more replies that he gives. What about the difference of motivation? Once again, he hits us with that example of the drunk versus the homicidal driver. Consider the motivation and the intentions of the two individuals in that scenario. The drunk driver doesn't intend to kill or hurt people. They are kind of just selfishly um, not wanting to pay for ride service or stay at a place where they would have to stay overnight or ask someone to drive them. So their motivation is not really evil. It's just kind of uh, poor, poor judgment and um, irresponsible. On the other hand, the homicidal driver has got an evil motive, which is certainly um, despicable to try and hurt people and kill them. Now, who has the worst motive? Clearly, the homicidal driver has a worst motive. But does this excuse and remove all blame from the drunk driver just because they don't hurt, they don't want to hurt people, but they very well could because of the inebriation? So once again, even if you have a motive that doesn't compare to the motive of the killer when you fail to assist, we could still say that knowing that the failure to assist adds exposure of risk to certain people of death from starvation, then that makes it wrong, even if the intention is not on a par with the intent to kill. And then finally, he says about this thing that it's not hard to not kill, but it's very hard to save all the lives that you could save. Um, he says, well, that actually kind of gets my argument wrong because he's saying that he's not actually arguing that um, we should spend all our time, all our money in like a never ending all out quest to just save as many lives in the third world as possible. Instead, he thinks we should see it as a more modest obligation to just do something instead of nothing. And so if the standard of giving or aid is just something rather than nothing, 
then he sees that as not so difficult of a burden for us to live up to. And therefore, the saving of lives, not necessarily all that you can, but just some rather than none. He doesn't see that as being so difficult. So um, moving on from that, he finally now has, he thinks, played a little defense against possible objections to his whole initial setup. And now he's going to try and fully state the obligation to assist argument. So kind of like a famous argument of Peter Singer. You would find it on page 145 of the book. Um, and I'm just going to write it out the same way it's written there in the book. So obligation to assist argument. <clears throat> okay, so arguments in logic and in philosophy, formal argumentation involves having a set of premises that lead to a conclusion. And the conclusion is the statement that you're trying to justify and argue for. And the premises are the reasons and the evidence that give backing and support to the conclusion. So with every argument, there's at least one premise and there's always one conclusion. In this case, we have three premises that lead to the conclusion below. So I'm going to try and write them all out. The first premise says this. It's an if-then statement, which they call hypotheticals. But the if-then statement that begins is this. If you can prevent a bad thing without making a comparable sacrifice, then in that case, you should. You should prevent that bad thing. Okay? So if, if we can prevent a bad thing without... There's a little qualification. Without making a comparable sacrifice, if that, then in that case, we should prevent the bad thing. Okay? So that hopefully is not too hard. It's just saying if there's something bad and you can make it not happen, you can stop it from happening, and that wouldn't require major sacrifices then that is a situation where you should go ahead and prevent that bad thing. The second premise is, second and third premises are very simple and straightforward. The second one just says absolute poverty is bad. And then the third premise continues from there to say that we can prevent some absolute poverty without making a comparable sacrifice. without making a comparable sacrifice. Okay, so let me hear your deduction. Write in the chat, if you can, the conclusion of this logical argument. You see the three premises, and then it's just a simple deduction, elementary logic here. What could be the conclusion? You have this statement, if we could prevent a bad thing without making a comparable sacrifice, then boom, we should do that. And absolute poverty is bad, and we can prevent some without making a comparable sacrifice. So therefore, what do you say follows in this case? Just let me know. Okay, just look at that argument and try and compute that conclusion. Just a little bit of deductive reasoning, but it's not too hard. Let me see who can say the conclusion, maybe. I'll let you take a second. But do, don't leave me hanging too long. What do you think? <clears throat> if you could prevent a bad thing without making a major sacrifice, you should. This is something bad. We can't prevent it without making a major sacrifice. So good. That's right, Ellie. Therefore, we should prevent um, some, at least, absolute poverty. Okay, and if you're wondering why, like in the conclusion of an argument, this is the claim that's being defended. And if you're asking, well, why is this true? You look at the premises, and these are the reasons given for it. Why would we? Why should we? Because we can, and because when you can, you should. And this is something bad. So therefore, according to this hypothetical and the two following premises, 
we have this consequent of the hypothetical, then we should. Um, <clears throat> now, to further defend the argument and give reinforcement for its claims, he um, tries to justify the various premises. When you have a valid argument in, um, in logic, which this is, that means that if the premises are true, then the conclusion has to be true just as a matter of necessity. And um, <clears throat> so if these premises are givens, or if you grant the premises, then this conclusion you, you cannot deny because this conclusion is a logical consequence of the premises. So the only way to reject the, the conclusion is to find at least one premise that you think is false. Because if you concede that they're all true, then you can't deny this conclusion. So which premise is false? And that's where Peter Singer says, you really can't find fault with these three premises. The, the bottom two, well, we'll get to those. Let's talk about number one first. For him to defend the premise number one, he gives an example, it's just kind of a famous example, um, example given drowning child scenario, okay? Okay, so this is a famous example that Peter Singer uses to illustrate the intuition behind this claim here. So I need you to think of a hypothetical for a moment. Um, here's something funny about this. I mean, I guess um, it's just interesting, but this is a hypothetical case that Peter Singer gives in these articles. But um, it actually ended up happening in real life uh, not too long ago. So I have like a lot of philosopher friends and stuff, and someone circulated an article like in The Guardian where a case played out exactly as Peter Singer's hypothetical described. So that's just kind of interesting. Keep in mind that these hypotheticals, there's nothing that really in many cases prevents such a thing from actually happening, but it doesn't only have philosophical interest when it actually happens. We can think about the hypothetical scenarios, whether they're real or not. But anyway, take the case of a drowning child. So there's, let's say you're walking along, just having a nice walk somewhere, and you come across like a little shallow body of water, like a pond or something. And as you look at the pond, you notice something kind of, unusual, which is that there's a child in there thrashing around that's having a hard time staying afloat. Basically, they can't swim. And there's no one else around at that time. The child sees you, and they call out to you, help me, help me. I'm going to drown. I don't want to die. Just lift your hand out and pull me out. So that's a little child, right? And um, clearly, a child's death is a bad thing. So in this situation, let me ask, what do you think? If all you have to do is lean over for half a moment, and exert yourself and take a second of your day to pull this child out and prevent their death. Do you think that you'd be morally obligated to do that? Or that you would have the prerogative to just say, nope, that's none of my business and I'm going to let this kid go. What do you think? Would that be an obligation or not? Would it be permissible to just decline assistance in this case? Or do you think that, I mean, just what does your moral intuition tell you on this? He thinks it's immediately obvious. So hopefully, I don't know. It's not too controversial, but most people would say, yeah, that's an obligation, okay? And I see that you're saying the same. Yeah, so it's an obligation. It's a moral obligation. We can't say this is an easy rescue scenario, no risk to me, no major sacrifice at all. Um, a bad thing could happen here, and you could prevent it without making any kind of major sacrifice, so certainly that there you should. Now, let me modify the case just a little bit, okay, because he does this also just to kind of make a point. Now I'm changing the case just slightly. Suppose as you walk up, there's the same case. It's like a child's drowning. They're asking help. They're calling out for you. But now I'm telling you this, version number two, you're not just wearing like, you know, your sweats and just like, you know, the stuff you'd wear at home during the pandemic. But you're, let's suppose, wearing like a really, really nice outfit, like a very expensive, full-on great fit. It's just like designer everything, very expensive. So, I mean, this could be like $1,000 each piece. Um, you're dressed to the nines, okay? And um, when the child's calling out to you in this version, let's say that you can't just reach an arm out and pull him up. It's not too, it, I mean, for you, this is a shallow body of water. So you could easily just walk right into it and get him and bring him out. He's too short for that to stay up on his own two feet. Um, but he's a bit further back in the water. And let's say it's muddy and it's murky. And so you're going to actually have to kind of wade in there a little bit. And you're basically going to destroy and ruin this amazing outfit that you're wearing now. So now the sacrifice is a little bit boosted up. It's not just the momentary exertion and time, but now I'm including in there that you're going to have to ruin, you know, a, a nice outfit, very, very nice outfit with the shoes, pants, top, whatever it is, you know, for guy or girl, whatever fit you're thinking of. Okay, so question again, 
by changing the case this little way, do you think that the moral obligation has gone away? Now I'm not obligated. Before I was obligated when it didn't cost me an outfit. But now if you say it's going to cost me the outfit, hey, that's not an obligation. Or what? What do you think? Is it still an obligation to assist and save this a child? You're not at risk of death, but you're going to have to mess up your clothes. What would you think there? <clears throat> I, I, I'm hoping, I don't know, I can't really say what 